Okay, so uh, I'm going to get started. I'm going to try to speak, I think, extremely close to this microphone to be loud and avoid feedback. If anyone can't hear me, I guess, like, wave your hand at me and I'll, I'll take it as a hint. I'm sometimes a little quiet, so, you know, be as, uh, you know, direct as possible in telling me. Um, so, uh, I'm, uh, my name's Jack Jameson, by the way. I'm a PhD student at the University of Toronto. Uh, and uh, I've been talking with Don Walker, who's uh, been very busy uh, organizing this event, um, uh, a lot about sort of the notion of decentralization and how it's used in many different kinds of projects uh, and how sometimes there's not a lot of uh, clarity about exactly what that means. So there was a moment in Corey's talk where he said, you know, freedom is great, but it's not really well defined, and I think decentralization is maybe used uh, in some similar ways sometimes. Uh, so I guess I'll get started by pointing out that, of course, decentralization is a key concept for many of the types of networks that we're talking about over these three days. And we're probably generally in agreement that if we see a network that looks like this, and yes, I know it's sideways, uh, then we think it might look, or it might lead to, you know, concentrations of power and situations like this, which we maybe would like to avoid if we can. So to avoid single points of control, uh, we can build decentralized networks that might look a little bit more like this, and they distribute power across the different people participating. And this is a key mechanism into making these into our networks, right? When we participate in a network that looks maybe more like this, we can feel in control of a little corner of it. So probably most of us are in general agreement that decentralization is a, you know, a pretty good tool for achieving the kinds of networks that we want to build and use. But I mean, if you look through the program for this event, you'll quickly realize that we have very different ideas uh, about how decentralization will occur. Uh, what new centers of power may be cultivated, and how these details will shape possibilities for power, justice, and culture. So in brief, decentralization is not really much of an end in itself, but rather is a means to many potential ends. So I'm going to present uh, some historical vignettes to show how architectural decentralization has served multiple different dimensions of social and cultural power. Uh, and then I'll talk uh, about uh, a couple of significantly different approaches in contemporary uh, examples, the IndieWeb and Secure Scuttlebutt. And my aim is to help us think beyond you know, mere decentralization and more substantively think about uh, you know, our social and epistemic commitments and what we're actually achieving, and particularly when we decentralize in one area, what kinds of other centers of power may we be you know, preserving or creating. So, Decentralization has, of course, always been a key feature of the internet, so where better to start than by talking about the ARPANET, the precursor to the internet created by the United States Department of Defense in 1969. The so decentralization was obviously a really core design feature of the ARPANET, and this is carried forward into all of the network uh, and internet infrastructures that we use today. So why was decentralization so important? And we have to remember that the context that this was developed, uh, it was to support military communications, and this was the middle of the Cold War. So in his account of why ARPANET was built, Lukasik wrote, the technical solution to avoiding decapitation involved new ways of routing and switching in decentralized and distributed communication systems that could survive damage from an attack. So decentralization here served to increase resilience of the network in the face of a nuclear attack. Now, as you know, academics and other users were getting on these kinds of networks, we could see that it had a lot of other utilities besides just this resilience. Uh, it was clear that this engendered you know, new types of collaboration, distribution of resources. But fundamentally, because the ARPANET was built for the US military, which is you know, a rigidly hierarchical organization with very strict command and control structures, uh, access was limited. So for cost and security reasons, uh, there was a long period of time where the only people who could actually access ARPANET were members of the military and academic computer science departments who had funding from the Department of Defense. So ARPANET used this decentralized architecture to distribute power across its network, but actually getting on that network uh, was still quite an exclusive club. And there was a lot of people who looked at this kind of network and said, this is a really wonderful thing and we want to join, and then started building kinds of alternatives. And there's a whole bunch of these. One of the most well-known uh, was Usenet. 
So Usenet was created in 1979 uh, by Tom Truscott and Jim Ellis, who were grad students at Duke University. And the basic idea was that any Unix computer could connect to Usenet and participate in these discussion threads, which were categorized under these kinds of topics, computers, humanities, news, and so on. Uh, and in a, a handout that was distributed at a Usenix meeting in 1980, uh, they described that a goal of Usenet has been to give every Unix system the opportunity to join and benefit from a computer network, a poor man's ARPANET, if you will. So we see a system that has a lot of architectural similarities to ARPANET in terms of its sort of routing and switching, uh, but expresses a different kind of decentralization by opening up access to a much broader audience. So basically, in order to use Usenet, you didn't have to go get permission in the same way that you did for ARPANET. And I'm going to jump forward to the World Wide Web, invented in 1989. And this idea of permissionlessness is really central here, too. So anyone can create a web page, right? Of course, you have to get hosting of some kind, but there are multiple pathways to do that. There's not like one central bureaucracy that you have to go through, of course. And when Tim Berners-Lee was describing uh, Enquire, which was the software program that would become the web, he argued that one of its fundamental properties was that it had to be completely decentralized. And architecturally, this means that every server should be kind of essentially equal. In the details, maybe this isn't always quite the case. It's a little idealized. But uh, you know, fundamentally, we have principles like net neutrality based on every server, every person is you know, more or less equal on this network. And in this idea, uh, there are assumptions about reciprocity between people who are participating. So one of Berners-Lee's original visions was that people would not just be able to view pages in a web browser, but also be able to edit pages directly from their web browser. So the people using the World Wide Web in the early days were assumed to be peers who had equal need and want to both produce and consume content. Now, the web was developed at CERN, which is an internationally renowned, renowned research facility, and its early users were elite technical workers. Uh, so they were peers, they did have significant technical knowledge to know how to use these kinds of tools, and they did have you know, reason to speak to each other as peers to produce and consume in equal parts. So for these users, the web was a dramatically easier publishing platform than you know, things like journal articles or you know, other forms of traditional publishing. But as the web became more and, pop more and more popular among the general population, of course, it's still much more accessible you know, for a regular person to create a web page in, in the 1990s than it was for them to you know, publish an article in a magazine or get on TV or participate in the traditional media that way. But there was still a lot of technical barriers. You, know, you had to learn HTML, you had to get access to a server, you might have to learn how to use FTP or otherwise connect to that server. So these were still a bit of a barrier for a lot of people. So the web that was so focused on being used for both reading and writing content, uh, was used by a lot of people really predominantly or solely for consuming. By the mid-2000s, there was a kind of a shift in the public consciousness of what the internet could be used for. This is demonstrated uh, by things like Time Magazine in 2006 declaring, Don's smirking at me, because this is, yeah, a little weird, but, uh, things like Time Magazine saying that you, yes, you, you are the person of the year, you control the information age. And this wasn't happening, this idea in the public consciousness wasn't because of people hosting websites on the server in their closet. It wasn't because of people posting to Usenet, it wasn't even because of people using like, GeoCities or other things. This was people posting to YouTube and Facebook. So. In 2019, at a conference where we're talking about building alternative networks and maybe have quite critical ideas of these big corporate platforms, our view is probably not quite so rosy. We may not say, oh, everyone controlled the information age. Facebook did that. But nonetheless, I don't think we should underestimate how much these did open up uh, the ability of regular people who didn't need to have technical, uh, you know, higher levels of technical skill to post and express their stories and share them. So, in brief, we can see between ARPANET and Usenet, they had similar decentralized network architectures, but they had very different approaches to how control over access was centralized. And between the early web and platforms, what we can see in the early web, it was permissionless. Each web server was treated more or less equally. Compared to platforms, not permissionless. You have to agree to terms of service and sign up for a site. I wouldn't say every server is treated equally because certain servers have a lot of control over gatekeeping, what people see, 
surveilling things, monitoring content, showing ads, etc. However, they did lower technical barriers and did help empower a lot of people in a way that we shouldn't ignore. Now, I've told sort of a very, very, very selective history, but I'm trying to highlight here that uh, we can decentralize in one area, but there's a bit of a push and pull between, you know, we decentralize one thing and another thing gets centralized, and it's not as simple as saying we'll just decentralize it. Um, another part of that is I focused mainly on access to networks, and I've not talked about administration. And there's a few examples that are, I think, really important. One, for about 30 years, one person, John Postal, was responsible for coordinating, advocating, and registering domain names, etc. And although ARPANET was decentralized at a protocol level, if once you wanted to get on ARPANET, you had to you know, rely on the manual and gendered labor of women who worked at the Network Information Center. And there's things like the HTML spec is ultimately under the authority of one editor, Ian Hickson. Now, my point here is not to say that any of these people are doing or have done a bad job. And in fact, I think there can be a really good case to be made that having these strong long-term leaders can be really good for innovation and can lead to you know, good things. Uh, and often, perhaps, be better than consensus models in some cases. But again, the point is we decentralize in one area, and we may be masking centralization elsewhere, like an administration, or we may be creating new centers of power. Now, I'm going to jump ahead now to talk about a couple of contemporary projects. So I'm going to talk about the indie web and a little bit about Secure Scuttlebutt, both of which are kind of decentralized-ish uh, social, uh, social networking platforms. And I should note here, neither of these platforms leans on like decentralization as a catch-all descriptor for what they do. They both present kind of very clear visions for their principles, and they have a strong sense of the potential social and cultural uh, effects of what they're doing. Uh, but they both do use decentralized architecture to achieve these goals and do so in very different ways with very different effects. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the IndieWeb. The idea of the IndieWeb is that individuals can have a personal website at their own domain name. And because it's your website, you can own and control uh, what you post on your site. You can post whatever you want. No one's, you know, you don't, again, you have that permissionless quality that we saw like in the, uh, in the web. And IndieWeb has developed some standards for communicating between sites. So you can send things like replies, likes, mentions, or other sorts of uh, interactions directly from one website to another. And then each website could make a decision like, oh, if someone replies to a post, maybe I'll display it as a comment below my article. Or they can you know, deal with that however they choose to. And finally, there's a lot of people on the IndieWeb who want to use their website to be able to talk to people on other social media platforms which could be these large corporate platforms, you know, Twitter, GitHub, et cetera, or could be uh, you know, parts of the Fediverse. So optionally, some indie websites syndicate their content to other platforms and then retrieve comments and other responses back from those platforms to display them on their original site. And the most popular tools for this are Bridgie or Bridgie Fed, which are right in the middle there. Now, when we look at the way that this is structured, what I want to highlight is because these are individual websites under individual's control, every website can be entirely different as long as they support the same set of simple standards. So each of these websites over here could be running a different content management system or just be static HTML pages or you know, anything like that. Uh, they can use multiple different methods to be able to send mentions to other pages as long as they're following the standard. Uh, they could have dramatically different types of layouts or dramatically different types of content. So you, of course, sites that are organized like blogs or that have kind of time-based, you know, here's what I'm doing today, that's very common. But you could also create, you know, a fixed page or a fixed site with just sort of a small number of pages that are more long-term. And that syndication is optional. You can choose whether or not you want to talk to people on those other platforms. You don't have to do that. So. The fact that all of these things are variable and that you can choose how you want to do this uh, is covered under a principle that IndieWeb calls plurality, which I think is an important uh, element of decentralization. So here we have not just the network architecture being decentralized and peer-to-peer, -peer, but there's a diversity of approaches. On every single site, you could set it up a different way based on what you need. Uh, so there's multiple ways to do different things. And fundamentally, this leads to IndieWeb being very good at supporting things like individual empowerment. And in fact, IndieWeb's co-founder, Tantek Chelik, has said that basically IndieWeb's goals boil down to self-empowerment. 
And I want to compare this to how Scuttlebutt works. So Scuttlebutt works by, you start by installing an app, the most popular one is Patchwork, onto your device, and the app will be able to use the secure Scuttlebutt protocol to transmit and store messages. Each person on this network is identified by cryptographic key pairs, which means that they're identified on a device level. And Scuttlebutt is offline first, so it supports irregular connections. You can log on at one point, you can go sail on an ocean, lose internet, and then when you get to port and you have an internet connection or you connect to uh, someone's local network, then you can update your content that way. So as an example here, we can imagine uh, if Dawn has, of course, this picture of a cat that she wants to share, and we connect to the same local network, as soon as we're connected, then that cat's going to be copied onto my copy of the log. And then, since I've downloaded it, I can disconnect from that network, and I can still look at this cat anytime I want. And then later, if I connect to a network with someone else, I'll replicate Don's post to that person. So this is a gossip protocol, where you sort of pass on what you've received to different people. Now, I can additionally connect to a pub server, which is an online server, so you can reach a much broader audience. And then that way, this cat is now spreading all over to people who have not actually connected to Don or even directly with me. Now, say that I connect to that public server, and someone has posted something objectionable, like a picture of a spider. It's way too scary for me. But nonetheless, I connected, so it's ended up in my log. Now, if I connect onto other people, I'm going to be replicating this image onto them as well. I don't want to do that because it seems mean. So I will choose to block the person who posted that. And this means not only have I blocked them from what I see, but I've also said I'm not passing on this person's content anymore because they post scary spiders, and I don't want to deal with that. And Scuttlebutt calls this near moderation, where you kind of take responsibility for not just uh, what you yourself are posting, but actually how you pass on information. So I want to highlight two things from this model. So one, a lot of the time when we talk about network technologies, they present themselves with a sort of digital universalism. You know, we, we can picture everyone working on a network, having to use the same tools, everyone's kind of connected to the same thing, maybe it works more or less the same way for everyone. By contrast, Scuttlebutt's design explicitly emphasizes subjectivity, right? Each device is carrying its own copy of the log, and over time, every single copy is going to be different because what you see on Scuttlebutt is going to depend on who you connect with and when. Uh, so essentially, the log that you have will be a copy of your social graph, different from anyone else's. And there's no way to get a kind of God's eye view where you can see what everyone's doing on this network, because parts of it, may, people may not have ever connected to the internet at all. The second thing is that because everyone who connects to Scuttlebutt participates in the replication of messages, there's a responsibility to this. So if one wants to be part of a healthy community, then you have a responsibility to say, no spiders, cats, OK. So this is one of Scuttlebutt's principles of near moderation. And they describe this by saying, tending and pruning are not a stranger's duty. This is explicitly about being a member of the community, not about being like a third party moderator who works for a platform, but actively uh, trying to make sure that your community is healthy in the way that you want it to be. And both of these points, I think, highlight connections to ideas that are common in feminist technoscience. So for example, uh, Donna Haraway's argument that there is no view from nowhere and our focus on embodied knowledge. So when we participate in this kind of network, we are participating. We can never observe. For the sake of time, I've, of course, just touched on these kinds of systems very briefly. And I've only really highlighted one facet of each. So I'm aware I haven't quite done justice to either. But what I've tried to highlight is that in the decisions that we see on IndieWeb, we have an emphasis on individual freedom through plurality. And in the decisions we see in Scuttlebutt, and particularly the gossip model, we see that there's an emphasis on healthy and safe communities and responsibility for the communities that we participate in. And I was thinking about this during Renee's talk, because she talked about universalism in a really interesting way. And on one level, I kind of want to argue that these both move away from universal infrastructures, because, well, IndieWeb advocates ways of using the internet that can be dramatically different from person to person, and Scuttlebutt emphasizes this subjectivity. But then, of course, I have to acknowledge that in order to do this, they rely on shared standards. So there is still an underlying layer of a universal infrastructure that is necessary to create this kind of diversity. And finally, although I focused on kind of IndieWeb as being about individuals and Scuttlebutt as being about communities, 
both of these are, in fact, concerned with individual freedom and communities, uh, but they weight these priorities differently, and the specifics of their network architectures lead to very different outcomes. So near the beginning of this talk, uh, I showed this visualization to convey the kind of basic idea of a decentralized network. And this is, in fact, a visualization showing uh, indie websites. And it was laboriously crawled by Ryan Barrett, uh, who's a sort of active developer in the indie web community. But nonetheless, it's still incomplete because it is relying on crawling from link to link to link. And what I hope that I've made clear through this is that this kind of gesture to, you know, decentralization can mask questions that are much more important, right? When we say, oh, this is decentralized, we don't know anything from this kind of description about how information is actually communicated. We don't know who has access to this network. We don't know what the process of getting access is like. Are there explicit permissions required? Are there soft barriers like technical know-how? Are there financial barriers? We don't know who's laboring to make sure that this keeps running. We don't know who's defining the standards or protocols. We don't know where content moderation is performed. So, we don't know really any of the details that define the much more substantive social, cultural, and ethical consequences of the design decisions that have gone into this network. So I want to close by saying that decentralization is, of course, a very powerful call to action. And probably many of us are familiar with like the Decentralized Web Summit or redecentralize.org. And they make a really strong appeal to this. But as we respond to that call, uh, I think we, should have to be, we have to remain cognizant that when we decentralize part of a system, we tend to preserve or create other centers, or centers of power and points of exclusion. So therefore, we have to be thoughtful about the way we make decisions about how these systems work. We should be continually reflecting on them as they change and consider at every step how we can best build and preserve networks that serve our communities. Well, thank you very much.